Hi everyone and welcome to the Private Practice with Soul podcast. This is the first podcast for counsellors that just don't align with the traditional approaches to business and that want to use their spiritual gifts, talents and interests to create, you guessed it, a private practice with soul. So look, leave it to me to provide you with everything you need, including strategies that you can use to increase your income, reduce your workload and of course increase inquiries and referrals to your beautiful soul-led private practice. I love it so much. If you haven't done it already, grab your journal, grab your pen and let's begin. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Private Practice with Soul podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brooklyn Storm. Thank you for being here. Uh, This is actually the second time I've recorded the podcast this morning because uh, the first time I did it, it it turned out that the microphone wasn't properly plugged in. And so (laughs) when I went to play it back just to check it, it had all recorded. Of course, instead of looking at a a fuzzy line in GarageBand, I was looking at a flat line in GarageBand. (laughs) So yeah, literally the podcast flatlined uh, this morning. So I'm recording it again. Just a um, little cautionary note before we get started. This is going to be a bit of a controversial slash polarizing podcast. So I just want to give you fair warning. If you're somebody who's going to feel upset, angry, irritable, uncomfortable, triggered or any of those sorts of things um, by discussions about the relationship between education and fees, then I would just invite you now to click out and go and listen to something else um, this morning, something that might be a little bit more palatable. But for those of you who do feel like you have imposter syndrome, who do feel like you're unsure of what fee to charge, who are wondering what next step you might want to take in terms of your education, um, then this is absolutely a podcast that I would love for you to hear because I want to give you a perspective that's different to the norm, that's different to uh, what you might be hearing in our community and in some other groups that you might be in. Okay, so Without any further ado, I know my dreamiest private practice clients will enjoy this episode, but not everybody's my dreamiest client and they're they're not going to love it. And uh, I'm well aware of that, but I'm happy to go there. Okay, so let's get on with the show. So I want to just go right back to basics here and say that it's the therapeutic alliance that is the best predictor of the outcome of therapy. Okay, we know this historically. Now, Freud was the first one to speak about this, but when he uh, spoke about it, he did so in the context in the context of the therapeutic alliance, um, almost having a bit of a negative feel to it because he was sharing it within the bounds of transference and counter transference. However, he himself later on reflected and revised his concept of the therapeutic alliance uh, to be something um, that was a lot more positive. Okay. So when I'm saying that, um, what I want you to know is that it was in 1913 that he first coined the term um, therapeutic alliance, but it, that definition evolved over time. Now, you and I often associate Rogers with the concept of the therapeutic alliance, but it wasn't his actual concept. What he did was he embraced it and said, well, this is the most active component of the therapeutic relationship and of the therapeutic outcome. And he defined it as um, the ability for the counsellors to demonstrate things like empathy, congruence and unconditional positive regard um, because he viewed those as being the necessary and the ideal conditions for, um, you know, client-centred therapy, which was his jam. But later on, um, this all sort of got more attention in the research and in the literature and was explored in terms of um, is the therapeutic alliance the best predictor of outcome for just individual work or is it also the best predictor of outcome for group work? 
given that group work is so much more complex because you usually have a facilitator and a co-facilitator, plus you would have six plus um, clients in the group. So you've got all those different personalities, all the different challenges, all the different perceptions, all the different relationships that you've got to manage. But even in group situations, the research consistently shows that above and beyond the psychotherapeutic approach that's been applied at that time, it's the relationships between the therapists and the clients that are the best predictors of outcome. And if those relationships are favorable, then the outcomes are favorable. Okay. So that's what I want you um, to understand. And then it was kind of in the um, uh, mid seventies that, you know, there was more interest in, again, further defining the definition of therapeutic alliance and the role of it. Um, And most notably, there was research done by a chap called Alexander Laborski. And he was sort of saying, well, we can take this further and look at uh, the role of the therapeutic alliance at different stages of the therapeutic process. And he said that um, in the beginning, the role of the therapeutic alliance needed to be very supportive, okay, that in the early phases of therapy, um, the client's perception of us as the counsellor as being supportive was instrumental to getting positive outcomes or favourable outcomes. And the second phase was usually more typically found as therapy progressed and it was about a representation of the collaborative approach perceived by client and therapist in terms of you know sharing that responsibility in working to achieve the goals of therapy um, and a sense of yeah communion like we're doing this together we're in this together to help that client address overcome unpack resolve work through whatever the challenges were So, um, you know, this went on and on and on. There was more and more um, research done, more and more research done. And consistently, it didn't matter if it was from um, psychology or counselling or other types of therapy. It didn't matter what psychotherapeutic approach was being used over and above every single time. The best predictor of the outcome in therapy, the best predictor of a good therapist was their ability to provide that supportive space and work collaboratively with collaboratively with their client on the client's goal. Okay, let me say that again. It had nothing to do with what approach therapeutically was being used, i.e. it didn't matter if you were using CBT or solution-focused or client-centered. None of that mattered. What mattered above and beyond, above and beyond consistently is the quality of the therapeutic alliance. And so here's why I think that this is really, really important. If you are holding back on charging the right fee for you because you have a belief that says, I'm not worthy of charging that fee because I only have a a grad dip or I only have a honours or I only have a master's or something like that. You're doing yourself a disservice and you're doing your clients a disservice. Um, The level of education that you have has no bearing on your ability to get outcomes. That's what all of this research is saying. And that's why this is such a controversial thing to talk about. And the reason that it's controversial to talk about is because when you're a member of certain groups in, say, the counselling industry, you are constantly being told that you're not good enough and that you have to get to this next level, that you have to do more training, that you have to do another certificate, another course, another program, another degree in order to move up a level and be more valuable to the community. And it's BS. It has your education has nothing to do with your worth and your value as a counsellor. That is an organisation telling you, if you want us to see you as worthy, these are our requirements of that. But it's not the community's sense of your worth and it's not your client's sense of your worth. Okay, and here's what I want you to know. You have to question things sometimes. I want to 
believe and trust that leading organisations in the field of counselling are well aware, well and truly aware that the level of education has nothing to do with outcomes because all the research is there and you would trust that leading organisations are familiar with the research. So then it asks, it, it beg, beggars the question in my mind, well, why are they then placing all of this um, um, importance on making sure you've got this next degree and this next level and this next whatever, when they know it's got nothing to do with how, how good of a client, uh, how good of a counsellor you are? They know that. So why are they getting you to jump through all of these hoops? Why are they actively, in my opinion, it's just my opinion, why are they actively cultivating imposter syndrome in their members by telling them, hey, do you know what? You're not good enough. Um, We're not going to let you do this because you're not at this level or that level or you don't have that degree or that qualification. Why would, why? What's the intention there? It makes no sense. It makes no sense. Um, Wouldn't it make more sense if these groups, if these membership organisations who understand and are aware that your level of education has nothing to do with the outcomes or very little to do with the outcomes, who understand that the Therapeutic Alliance is above and beyond the best predictor of the outcomes, wouldn't it make sense that they would want all of their members to be consistently getting the highest outcomes with clients? So wouldn't it make sense that they put the emphasis on your ability to develop those relationships with clients? And maybe instead of you having to go and do another degree and spend another $35,000 so you can move up a level or do you know what I mean? Maybe instead of that, they focus on providing you with some professional development on the art of building a therapeutic alliance. <laughs> wouldn't that make sense? And wouldn't it make sense to reward members who are demonstrating efficacy that they're, you know, amazing at building these therapeutic alliances with a higher level, right? Wouldn't we want to be recognizing those people? And wouldn't that serve as an encouraging thing for newbies to come in um, knowing that their measure of um, uh, approval with that organisation was going to be based on their ability to get a good outcome based on the therapeutic alliance. Isn't that more equitable? Isn't that more, um, doesn't that just make so much more sense? And so I was thinking about this last night, right? I'm sitting there in bed and I'm reading through the comments in my groups and I'm like, this is nuts. Why are, why are these people feel, these people meaning members in my groups, why are they feeling so pressured financially to go and do another degree just so they can go up to level three or level four with whatever group they're in um, when education has nothing to do with the outcome? Like what is what is behind that? And you know what? When you start digging around a little bit, it's very interesting because you start to see the relationships between the people, the higher ups of these organisations and the institutions that they encourage you to go and do your study at. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything else. Um, but do you know what I mean? The, there's relationships there between the institutions and and these membership bodies and these membership bodies are telling you hey this is who we recommend you go and do some training with but what's the point what it it doesn't make any sense what's the point like how's it going to help you it's not how's it going to help your clients it's not shouldn't these organizations have a vested interest in helping you help your clients and with that awareness that your level of education has pretty much nothing to do with your ability to get those outcomes. Shouldn't I be focusing on, you know, things around your ability to build relationships with clients? Shouldn't the training that they want you to do involve around how to work with a resistant client, how to work with a client who's not going to talk to you in a session, how to work with a client that um, you're perhaps not feeling the love for in that moment or how to navigate your your own internal staff in a session so that you can create an environment that's going to cultivate 
that alliance? Shouldn't they be teaching you how to collaborate with a client um, so that that client feels like, you know, you're in it together and, and you're achieving the goals together? Shouldn't the requirements of those membership groups be around, hey, this is how you're going to measure um, your ability to create that therapeutic relationship? And shouldn't they be giving you some assessment tools that you can use um, so that you know if you're on the right track? And wouldn't that be empowering for you to be able to use those tools yourself and to self-assess your progress in building those relationships? And wouldn't that empowerment contribute to a sense of confidence? And wouldn't that sense of confidence dispel the sense of imposter syndrome that you might be experiencing if you didn't have it? Like, think <laughs> this is what I'm saying like I'm I get so worked up about this because I don't like um you know when we know that things are one way why are we being told well you've got to jump through all of these other hoops instead it it doesn't make any sense to me um Anyway, I, I feel like this was at the start of the podcast, right? I, I did share that this could be triggering and controversial and polarizing. Um, and it's because some people don't question anything. Um, they give implicit trust to people in organizations. They give implicit trust to their training institutions because, well, in psychology, it's called the white coat effect. And you can go and research it, but the white coat effect simply says that um, if there's somebody that wears a certain uniform or has a certain title, you tend to just give them implicit trust. They don't have to do anything to earn your trust. You just think that because they're in that position that they're trustworthy. So you never question it. And then when something like what I'm sharing comes out, you feel caught off guard because it flies in the face of your belief system. It's something you've never questioned before. Now you're having to question it. It's, you know, going to, you know, you might feel like things might come crashing down for you, especially if you are one of those people who believed that in order to be better at therapy, you needed to do more and more and more qualifications and you've gone and spent that money on, you're going to feel angry perhaps. Um, I, I would feel angry too, but you know what? Don't shoot the messenger. Um, you actually feel free to shoot me. That's fine. If you, if you need somebody, look, I am the one bringing this to your attention. So yes, if you want to shoot the messenger, absolutely come along and shoot me. Um, if this is something that you want to talk about, I would absolutely suggest that you do take it to supervision. Um, but of course you need to have the right supervisor to do that with. And that's going to be somebody who, um, perhaps has questioned things themselves and um, who doesn't subscribe to you know the the narrative that seems to be pervading our community at the moment so I, I always encourage you to question and that comes from my training I mean 14 years learning how to be a scientist practitioner you're taught to question everything and so I do um, I don't just take and accept things I often question but it's because I've got that drummed into me to to ask where does this come from why is this so and so I'm questioning why member organizations are requiring people to invest more money in doing education when these membership organizations know for a fact that your level of education has nothing to do with the outcomes why are they getting you to do that have a look at the relationships between who's higher up in these organizations and the types of organizations they're wanting you to do, to do the training with. Um, have a look at the institutions and their relationships with these member organizations as well. It goes both ways. Um, and question, like ask the questions, why aren't we being given the, the, the support we need to get better outcomes? We want a membership group that's going to help us do that. Um, we want a membership group that leans into the research um, and that supports us in being better practitioners, better counsellors, better therapists at building that alliance, at building a collaborative space with our clients, at building that support space, at cultivating congruence, at cultivating um, the empathy, at 
working with clients, not at a we're up here, they're down there, but as we're in this together, um, at dealing with some of the difficult obstacles and challenges that can come up with some client populations or some client presentations and skilling us to be able to deal with those in a healthy way so that we can get that therapeutic alliance back on track so that that client can have a better chance of a better outcome for their health and their well-being and have an amazing ripple effect on the community because when that client improves their health and wellness they're going to show up differently for their partner for their children for their loved ones for their work colleagues for you know the sports teams that they play on it has a ripple effect and you want to be part of that so I want the membership bodies to start leaning into that and less putting less emphasis on education so anyway to come back to fees I want what I want you to take away from this is your fees have nothing to do with your level of education um some membership bodies cultivate, actively cultivate a sense of imposter syndrome in their members. For me, that's unethical. Uh, it's certainly not what I'm about. I'm about empowering. I want you to feel empowered by knowing that your worth, whether or not you're good enough, is not based on the education, the level of education, the degree that you have or that you're doing or that you're thinking of enrolling in. It's not about anything to do with that. It's about how you show up in that relationship. And one of the things I know about counsellors is above and beyond any other um, industry, you do this better. You're already good at building those relationships. So base your fee on your ability to build that relationship. If you think, hey, do you know what? My clients enjoy working with me. I enjoy working with my clients. My clients get better. My clients get well, da, 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 da. Charge based on that because that is the best predictor of outcome, okay? There's so much more I want to say, but I don't want to get caught up in a rant. <laughs> if you want to discuss this podcast in our groups, here's the thing. Absolutely go for it. I appreciate this is polarizing. I appreciate it's going to be hard for people to hear. And I'm open to having the discussion because I feel it's a discussion that counselors need to have. Um, however, caveat there are boundaries around it there is zero tolerance in both of those groups counselors connect and the, and the ACPO group there's zero tolerance for bullying for tall poppy syndrome for nastiness for I was going to say a bad word but I won't but for for being mean that's not going to be tolerated but a respectful debate a respectful uh, a debate that comes from a space of curiosity um, a, dis a debate that's motivated by wanting to unpack and explore is absolutely welcome but no as I said zero tolerance for, for bullying and you know not being very nice okay so um, I hope this was a really helpful episode for you to listen to um, it's really for people who have struggled with thinking that they need to do more in order to charge more. I want you to know it's not about doing more, it's about who you're being. Um, and this is also for people that have struggled with setting their fees because they felt they weren't good enough. It's not about your worth being caught up in your education. This is about your the worth of a session being based on your ability to build that relationship with a client. And if you can do that, you charge what you're worth. Okay, so hope this was helpful. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this, I um, am happy, as I said, to discuss it. I will also put some information in the caption for this podcast episode on Instagram. Uh, you can get that at the private practice coach. All right, I'll talk to you soon. Bye. I hope that you loved this episode as much as I loved putting it together for you. To get more resources to help you in your private practice, head over to Instagram. My handle is at the private practice coach. And also, if you want more inquiries and referrals for your business, let me know. I have a program called Clients on Demand that opens every quarter, and I can absolutely get you some information for that as well. You are doing an amazing job. Thank you for sharing your gifts with the world. Bye.